and gratitude indeed. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Tom Bryce. Thank you, Dr. Tony McNeil, for an amazing worship service. Can we give God a hand clap for God's presence with us today? Uh, these amazing people uh, who brought us this worship service today. Thank you for all of the participants. Certainly thank you, Ray, for uh, supporting this effort, and thank you for uh, welcome. I also encourage all of you all to stay tuned in heart. We have another dynamic preacher in our closing worship who's joining us today. Uh, Dee Decker is the acting director of our communications area, and we are looking forward to hearing from Dee Decker on tomorrow afternoon. We move now into the immersion experience. We have, a again, a list of amazing, amazing speakers who will join us um, over the next two days. And we begin today with Dr. Gary Neal Hansen. I'll try to do a brief introduction of uh, Dr. Hansen. Um, I invite you to Google him. Um, there's far more than I can say and take up too much of Dr. Hansen's time. But Gary, as he uh, has invited me to call him, um, is a writer, retreat speaker, and church historian. He's the author of several books, including Kneeling with Giants, Learning to Pray with the History's Best Teachers, and Love Your Bible, Finding Your Way to the Presence of God with a 12th Century Monk. A visiting scholar at the University of Pittsburgh's Department of Religious Study, he also previously was professor of church history and the chair of the history and theology division at the University of Dubuque. We are so happy to have Dr. Hansen with us today as he takes us into the first of our marks. If you don't mind, or as they used to say in my childhood tradition, if you're not too mean, if you can clap as we bring to the microphone, Dr. Gary Hansen. Well, let me get a few things arranged here. It is good to be with you. I am grateful for this opportunity. Um, Heather, do I, does my first slide come up automatically, or do I do this? There I am. That's not me, but there's my slide. Um, it is great to be here. I am so ple pleased and blessed to be able to be doing something with this initiative. The vitality of our congregations in the PCUSA is near and dear to my heart. I, uh, while I was in graduate school, I pastored a struggling little Presbyterian church just north of Princeton. Um, and we had, a, we had quite a journey together. I, I've been formed by some remarkably vital congregations and had the opportunity to serve a really struggling congregation. I've had other opportunities for service since, but, um, but, that, but that concern for helping churches that struggle come into a place of new life and vitality and participating in Christ's resurrection life so that we can participate in Christ's reconciling mission is very important to me, so I'm just thrilled to be able to have any part at all in the VCI, so thank you for welcoming me. Hello to you out in TV land. I know that there are more of you uh, than there, out there than there are here in the room. I will try to remember to keep looking at the camera. And one more bit of, of very small business before we start. If you find yourself w wanting to sort of not sit and doodle notes or whatever like that, or if you uh, don't want to be distracted, if you'd like to just have a copy of the slide deck and the uh, my notes for it, um, Tony, if, if somebody, if, are you doing the chat? If so, Tony was monitoring the chat, but he has disappeared. Um, if, if Tony or Marla could put that note in the chat so that people, or that, that, that URL in the chat, if you sign up there, the notes will automatically come to you. It'll also automatically sign you up to my newsletter, and if you don't want to be on that, you can unsubscribe anytime, but it comes as a package deal uh, for at least the day. Um, there you are. Okay, and with no further ado, let's jump into the agenda of the day, which is lifelong discipleship. Now, the VCI, as you know, we've got these seven marks of, of the, 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 the people who wisely put together this initiative said, these are things that, that mark, are identifiable in the life of a congregation that's vi vi vital. And I think the implication is that if we're wanting to, in, to boost the vitality, these are things that we can put our energy into that we can invest ourselves in and take steps towards embodying these things that mark vitality and that we will then mark, be marked by increasing vitality. 
And I think they wisely put this one at the beginning of the list. Mark number one, lifelong discipleship. We need to be congregations made up of people who are disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, if, if, our, if we're going to have the, a genuinely Christian vitality, it needs to come from there, from the core, from the way we relate to the one who has come and reconciled us to God, who has given us new life in the resurrection. So um, I'm really, I want it, I think it's kind of providential. I think we're moving from the inward to the outward in the flow of this immersion. We're starting this morning really with ourselves, as, our, as ourselves in our own discipleship, thinking about our own vitality, um, because that's what's going to join together with people in the, uh, who are around us in our congregation so that we can be a congregation of vital, lifelong, growing disciples. So well, I think if we were making this more of a workshop than, uh, than just a keynote, I would say the place to start is to take stock, to say, where are we on the path? We're all somewhere on the journey with Christ. We're all somewhere in the journey of discipleship. We can look back to what got us into this process in the first place. Maybe we were born in a congregation. Maybe we had a conversion and found ourselves part of a congregation of other disciples. But we all started someplace, and we all are someplace right now. So I want to offer you, for your consideration, three simple models that we might have consciously or unconsciously in, in, our, in our sense of ourselves as disciples wanting to grow in vitality. Model one, I think very common, is simply my church. I'm committed to the institution. I want to make this congregation thrive. And in a sense, that desire to help the congregation thrive embodies my discipleship. Now, it, now it's not always it's not always the most helpful view of what discipleship is. You know, when I was pastoring this struggling church in New Jersey, um, I, this is really what made a Presbyterian out of me. I'd been a Presbyterian for many years, but I got ordained to serve this church, and people in my presbytery, other uh, teaching elders in my, in my presbytery, came out of the woodwork, whether they were on the same place in the theological spectrum as me, they came out of the woodwork to be helpful because they wanted me to thrive in my ministry, and they really wanted this congregation to thrive. So I had so much love poured out on me by the other ministers in my presbytery that it, it, it made me really believe in this form of, of life that we have as Presbyterians. And I described to them, but anyway, I described to these people that were trying to be helpful what was going on in my church. And I'd, I'd say, you know, what I can really say about these people is they're really committed to the institution. They're committed to the institution. And I kept hearing those words come out of my mouth. And I thought, that might not be the best phrase. To be committed to an institution, that's not always an optimal life outcome. That's not what you're looking for. And actually in our discipleship, it's not always the most helpful thing. We can become so dominated by helping make sure we meet the budget, helping make sure we invite a few new people, helping make sure we have somebody to teach the Sunday school, helping make sure we have a carpet that's decent to walk on. We get concerned with all of these things about institutional survival, and that occupies the foremost place of our brain, and it distracts us from bigger, more theologically grounded understandings of what a disciple is. We need a deeper, richer understanding. Now, it's not to say that there's not a deeper, richer understanding at play. You know, I've known an awful lot of people whose lives in the church are really quite actively consumed by commitment to the institution. And if you could only get behind their theological, spiritual shyness, you'd find they have a deep and warm-hearted, lifelong commitment that's quite personal to Jesus. But we Presbyterians, we we kind of shy away from talking about that because we want to talk about the budget and the carpet and the Sunday school and the institution. But, uh, but what I want to see happen, and what I hope will happen in congregations' lives, is that the people who are committed to the institution will find ways to embrace a discipleship that puts front and center the actual substance of the faith that we share. And that's where these, my other two, the, the danger of this really, if you have just the commitment institution, is uh, you end up with sort of 
a congregation that's sort of bored to tears. You know, I, when, I was, when I was candidating for an academic position once upon a time long ago, a realtor gave me a tour of, of the town and was showing me at various churches and various neighborhoods I might live in and came to a church that was quite near the university campus where I was pr prospectively be teaching and said, that, now that church, if you come here, that might be a place you want to go. There are a lot of board members in that church. And what, you know, what she meant was different than what I heard, because uh, you know, the trustees, yes, lots of trustees in this, in this fairly affluent church, but I was thinking, I don't know that I want to go to a church with a lot of board members. Um, but that's what, that's what can happen. That's the downside of, the, of being overly committed to the institution. What we really want in the process of our life in a congregation is about life doing things, changing the world. Isn't, when you look at Jesus on the page of the pages of the Gospels, isn't he doing things to bring in the marginalized, to feed the hungry, to call out injustice, to maybe, like, maybe these guys, they're on a Habitat for Humanity thing, and they're building a house, and it's exciting. They're changing the world in one tangible way. Isn't that what we want? We want life. We want vitality. And I think that's what is going to come from my other two, somewhat more theologically grounded, uh, ways of thinking about discipleship. Now, before I tell you what they are, I want you to consider a strained and possibly inappropriate metaphor. I give you, as you think about the models of discipleship, to consider the lowly onion. Now, you all know, if you've done a little bit of cooking, that an onion is made up of layers. You know, and we think, well, we just peel away an onion, we'll get to the core, we'll get to the core, we'll go down another layer, we'll get to the core. But you know what? There, there's no core there. All there is is layers of onion. Each one's a little bit different. You know, you look at this red onion, it's a little bit red on one side, a little bit white on the inside. It, there's a kind of a, a transitional zone to every layer, but they're all layers of onion. So now I'm gonna give you two models of discipleship. I'm gonna tell you it's a little bit like an onion. They sound at first glance like either or, like opposing models of discipleship, but I think in many ways they're, they're just like different layers of the very same onion. If model one was it's me and my church, I got institution survival on the mind, model two of discipleship is follow Jesus. You know, Jesus looked at these guys with their fishing nets and said, come, follow me. And he looked at the guy at the tax table and said, come, follow me. He looked at different people, looked at Mary and Martha in their household and wanted them to follow him. And he welcomed them and they followed him around. And that model that he speaks at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry is a classic way to think about what it means to be disciples. Listen to, a, particularly I think, uh, in my hearing at least, it's particularly in the evangelical world, you hear this as quite prominent because they call, people often want to call themselves not Christians or church members, they want to say, I'm a Christ follower. That sense of identity as someone who follows Christ, that's, that's a pervasive understanding of discipleship uh, in our culture. It's good, it's biblical, it's holy, it, there's a lot of wisdom there. But I think it can lead us to a place of imbalance if we take it slightly the wrong way. It leads us, it undergirds not only the sort of evangelical, I'm a Christ follower sort of uh, sense, it also, I think, undergirds a lot of what goes on in more progressive Christianity with, with our activism. We want to change the world. Our faith drives us to go out and want to change the world in lots and lots of ways, because. Friends, the world needs a lots of changing. Uh, if it's going to look like Jesus talks about in the reign of God, it is going to have to undergo a couple minor modifications. So perhaps as disciples, we should engage in some of that. But you know, I think it's worth looking back to early in the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus has gone about his business saying to some of those early fellas with the fishing nets, come and follow me, and they came and followed, and he got to a nice round number, a manageable number, 12, good biblical number. And there's a scene in Mark chapter 3 where he says to these first 12 who came and followed him that they were going to be in a special relationship to, them, to him. He's going to make them apostles. Now, you've had your Greek probably, right? You know, it's, this, they are the sent ones. They are the activists, right? They're going to go out and do stuff for the reign of God. They're going to be disciples by going and changing the world. But how does the text put it? He, he chose 12 to be with him and to be sent out. He chose 12 to be with him. Come up, come with me on this mountain. Sit down, we're going to talk. Come and be with me. 
walk with me around Galilee and outside the realm of Galilee. Be with me. He puts it differently in a slightly different word toward the end of the Gospel of John when he's at the Last Supper in the upper room. And he says what he really wants for these people at the table, the Marys and the Marthas and the Peters and the Andrews, he wants them to abide with him, to remain with him, to draw close to him, so close that they're actually connected, part of the same life-giving system. Branches in a vine, you can't pull it out. The life flows from the vine to the branches. That picture of abiding is right there at the beginning of the call to follow because the call to follow is to draw close to Jesus. It's a call, in a sense, to a life of contemplation. It's to be close enough that you are gazing towards his eyes and seeing those big, brown, beautiful eyes full of love, calling you to let you know that you are so deeply loved that you are going to be overjoyed to bear witness in the world. We draw close the call to follow, what the seeming call to activism has underneath it, another part of the onion slice. It's a call to intimate fellowship of a transforming nature. And model three. Some of us, and this is actually a, a, a way that, this is, was really formative to me as I came to faith in high school um, and in university years, the model that, that struck me and was presented quite confidently to me was more, less about following Jesus and more about loving God. The first and great commandment, says Jesus, is to love. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength, which leaves li very little left over, right? There's very little wiggle room. Now, there is wiggle room. But, there's, but it sounds so all-encompassing. The whole of our being oriented toward God, this God who made us and redeemed us, this God who is full of glory, able to create all of the universe, the spinning planets, the swirling galaxies, all the swirling atoms that make your body. It's all made by God, this good and marvelous creation just to see the marvel of who this, what this God has done should fill us with awe and draw us close to orient our lives on saying, if this God can make this world and can do, go so far in stepping out to come down here to redeem us, I want to draw close and my whole life is going to be given its proper meaning by being in proper orientation around doing the will of this God uh, who made me and redeemed me. And that can seem to feed a kind of a contemplative drive primarily and less of an activist drive, right? I mean, it calls for everything. It calls for your heart. It calls for your inner drive, your motivation, your passion, all of it. It calls for your soul. That's psyche, right? The stuff you go talk to your psychologist about, your sense of yourself, the nature of your being and your identity. The whole of your soul is given its meaning in being belonging to this God and is oriented around loving this God. All of our mind, our curiosity, our understanding, we're made in the image of this God who is wisdom, Sophia, and Logos, the Word. We are made to have a mind that can understand with wisdom. And we need, and we need to orient all of our seeking after wisdom and all of our rationality toward loving this God. But it doesn't leave you in this inward place of contemplation. It also says you're supposed to love this God with your strength. That's why he segues rather quickly to say, there's a second commandment that's like unto the first. You love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't say love your neighbor to the same degree as you love yourself in a similar comparative manner to your loving yourself. But as yourself, as you pour out your love toward God, heart, soul, mind, and strength, you are expanded. So you look at that neighbor who seems so different with you, and you don't say, I'm going to love you as much as I love me. I'm going to do nice things for you just as I do nice things for me. It's like, no, you are me. We're part of the same body. We are one. You love your neighbor as yourself. Your sense of self expands to embrace the other as part of you so that when they are wounded, you suffer. And when they thrive, you rejoice because it's, we are one. 
And that takes us into activism, right? It takes us out to the neighbor so that we can expand further and really know the neighbor so that we can be the one and we can love. We love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength so that we love with strength the neighbor. We follow Christ um, so that we can be with him and then be sent out. It's all part of the same onion. Strained metaphor, possibly not helpful. No core, just layers. But that, those two models, I think, are prominent, helpful theological models. If you find yourself living with that first model of being committed to the institution, paying attention to the things that nurture bo either and both of these other models is good effort spent. Good effort spent on your own discipleship. Now, that's why I wrote Kneeling with Giants, the book that is in your swag bag. I don't know if we have physical swag bags, but that's how it was described to me. I, uh, good, okay, I enjoy the swag. I'm so happy to have a copy of my book in your hands. And, I, and, I, and the book called, is called Kneeling with Giants, Learning to Pray with History's Best Teachers, and it is about nurturing part of both of those models of discipleship. It's about taking a, to time and attention to nurture, to build your own actual relationship with God, drawing close and abiding, loving with heart, soul, mind, so that you can be who you are created to be, full of the resurrection energy and light of God to go out and love that neighbor and to change that world and to be part of that coming reign. It's part of tending to that which we have some control over and that we desperately need so that we can truly be who we really are for a lifetime. Because the VCI priority isn't just temporary discipleship. It's not discipleship for a season so you can then move on to it and leave, do something else. It's lifelong discipleship. Whether you are an infant or whether you are a septuagenarian, you are still a disciple, still needing to come and be with Christ and be transformed, still needing to love with heart and soul and mind as well as strength. So in the book, I look at 10 different uh, Christian traditions of prayer. I, had, I have numerous conversations with people who say, well, why is it only Christian uh, ways of prayer? Well, I, and one of my a very wonderful guy who lives across the street from me says, why don't, why don't you look at Buddhist ways of praying? You could, Christians could learn a lot from Buddhist ways of praying, and he's right. I just don't happen to be a, history, a historian of global, global religions. I'm a historian of Christianity. And my sense is that what I want to give to Christians is some of their own resources, stuff that already belongs to them that may not, may, may not know about yet, so that you can make use of the resources um, that really belong to, to global Christianity uh, rather than so sort of assuming that it's vapid uh, and meaningless and played out there's actually some rich stuff there. So I look at a variety, 10 different ways of praying. They're rooted, at, each one is rooted in a major branch of Christianity. There uh, are several from different facets of Catholicism. There's one that's Eastern Orthodox. There are several mainline kind of Protestant roots. We've got Luther, we've got Calvin, we've got the Puritans. Um, there, and there are, and then there's, there's an evangelical example from the modern world and a charismatic example from the modern world. It's, it's not every way Christians pray, but it's a pretty broad, global, ecumenical spread because I really, really want uh, for people who read the book to find out the, the kinds of resources that are available to them to deepen their prayer life, to draw close to God in ways that matter uh, and change their life so that they can be the ones who are sent. Now, I think, really, that this is kind of revolutionary. Um, Shea Guevara here and I would like to welcome you to the revolution. I think living the life of the onion, if you're really living a life of abiding with Christ for the sake of transformation so that you can then love neighbor as self, I think that's radical. It's much easier to play just one side. It's much easier to say, oh, I'm just, I'm just kind of a contemplative person, and I'm going to live my private prayer, little spirituality. You know, uh, I'm going to just stick to, to, to me and my faith. Or it's easier to say, no, I'm just going to pour myself out in activism. Um, it's, it is easier I mean, if, to, to, to just focus on one side of this or the other. I was presenting on this material um, the Kneeling with Giants material uh, with one of the um, thousand and one new worshiping communities a few years back, and and you know it, it it highlighted for me the sense that this call to the whole, 
to being doing both the contemplative and the activist is, is quite revolutionary. There's a guy, a wonderful guy, a pretty amazing guy actually in that congregation who was a, a significant activist. He had spent decades in different kinds of activ activism and most recently uh, working with, with children who of, of a variety of kinds that needed a, an awful lot of help uh, because there's need of structural change for the way children are, are, are dealt with in our society. Anyway, I'm not going to tell you his story, but he's a great guy. He's got a nonprofit. He's pouring his life out, and he did not want to hear me talk about prayer. In fact, he raised his hand and said, why should we be spending our time talking about prayer? Shouldn't we be doing things? Shouldn't we be doing what Jesus did to change the world? There's not time for this. I think it's revolutionary to say you actually need both. Uh, you actually uh, need both in a substantial way. Why? Well, I think if you don't deal with the whole, if you just pour yourself into the activism, uh, you find yourself eventually in a bit of a desert, uh, lost for your direction, uh, sometimes uh, feeling burnt out. That's one of the desert sorts of things that happen. It's dry out there. It's dusty. And if you keep pouring yourself out, pouring yourself, pouring yourself out and trying to change the world, you can, it can be really wearing, right? You can beat your head against a wall and wear your head out uh, because the world doesn't want to change. Uh, and that's kind of the bad news. Um, the kingdom of God is coming, and it needs to change, but the world is, is not all that happy about it. So it can be hard. And also there's the sense that sometimes your, your sense of center can be lost. Your sense that why you're doing the activism can become a little slippery, because what you're doing as a Christian from Christian motivations sometimes is so close to what other people are doing from motivations that are quite purely secular. And then it can feel, it can feel like, how am I, how is it a Christian thing specifically? You know, it's, it, it becomes a little slippery. Without it, I think the center can be lost and you can find yourself in the desert. If you do do the whole onion thing, right, if you do do the contemplative life for the sake of drawing near to Christ and being transformed and being sent, well, then life finds a way, right? You know, you've probably had this. It's annoying as heck. You know, you've got a sidewalk and there's a little gap between the concrete and life just keeps emerging. Whether you want it to or not, stuff starts to grow because there's a little soil there. With just a, providing a little bit of nourishment, a little bit of soil and a little bit of water, stuff grows. And I think that's what can happen. That's really what can happen in our discipleship as well. A little bit of attention, a little bit of repeated, steady attention to drawing near to Christ today actively, on purpose. Drawing near to Christ tomorrow actively on purpose and the next day and the next day and the next day some days it feels kind of stupid right sometimes it feels kind of boring but you keep coming back spending whatever time you allot in whatever mode you choose to exercise to be in the presence of god over time life emerges because you know even if you don't quite realize it in the moment when you go to meet with God, the God of the universe is actually there. This is not a theoretical matter. This isn't a little story we tell ourselves to keep us uh, happy and clappy in the church. There actually is a God who created heaven and earth, who bent heaven and earth to come in person, to be able to be known by us. And that God is waiting for you every hour of every day to come and be together, to abide with him as close as a vine and a branch. God is actually there. So even if you think you're doing something boring in your prayer life and something stupid in your prayer life, by keeping at it, you're actually, in your boring, stupid way, being in the presence of God. And God is showing up too. And the likelihood is that life is going to begin to emerge. Now, I don't want to encourage you to do boring, stupid things in your prayer life. I don't think that's the optimum goal or plan. Uh, what I think you really need is you need a well-rounded diet of prayer. Now, here's the thing. Lots and lots of us don't have a well-rounded diet of prayer because we don't know what the possibilities are of things that we might be doing as prayer that might be bringing life. You know, take the average person in the world. If they grow up, uh, in a fairly Christian family, chances are the way they know to prayer is the one their mom taught them or their grandma. Maybe their dad, maybe their grandpa, but a lot of times it's your mom or your grandma. Maybe that's a stereotype, but I've met a lot of people who learn to pray from their mom or their grandma. Um, 
somebody older, maybe it was the pastor in your church, gave you some lessons, maybe it was your Sunday school teacher, but somebody taught you something and got you going, and you think that's what prayer is. And so you keep doing that thing. That's why it becomes boring and stupid, because you just keep doing the same thing that you learned when you were four years old, and now you're 40, and times have changed, and you should maybe be thinking about doing something more 40-year-old in your life. You need a well-rounded diet of prayer, and you need to know how to do things that are available to other people in other churches that you don't know about because you go to the Presbyterian church, right? I, I, there's a, um, I'm hoping that this story doesn't come up later in my notes. Um, uh, but uh, I'm going to tell it now because I'm on it. I already started. Okay, there, when I, I used to teach this class, uh, this prayer material as a class at Dubuque Seminary, which was my favorite teaching experience ever, was going through this material in a practical way with people, getting them to pray uh, with other, to get them to pray in a particular way that was taught by a particular historical figure uh, in a particular time, to try to do that as homework. Then we'd come back to discussion. And what you're talking about is, what was it like to pray that way? All of a sudden, everybody in the class, they're not having theological arguments about whether they're left or right or something else. They're talking about what it's like to be with God in a particular way. A very rich kind of fellowship happens when you're sitting in a room with people, talk, and you all tried to be with God in the same way, and some of you liked it, and some of you didn't. Uh, some of you were stuck, and some of you were flowing, but, you know, it's, it's rich. And anyway, it, it, it makes for an amazing kind of uh, a fellowship focused on the actual subject matter of the Christian experience. So anyway, that's what we'd do. Here's what would happen one year. I, I had this one guy that came to the class, a wonderful guy. He grew up in a strongly evangelical home. Now, in his, and he wasn't yet Presbyterian. He was an independent evangelical hurt home. And in his church community and his home community, prayer was intercession. You are asking God to do stuff at your request. And they kept a little log book, you know. What they prayed for, watch for answers. Now, that can be a faith nurturing, nourishing thing if you do it right way, but it also can be like, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. God's, God's doing what I said. This is great. And so it kind of, but this, so, but that's, that's how it felt for my student when he was growing up. And he said, you know, I'm just not, I'm taking your class, but I'm not a prayer guy. Because for him, prayer was this kind of intercession, asking God to do stuff as if it's, oh Lord, not thy will, but mine be done. Uh, and he, he thought that there was something lacking theologically in that, and so he didn't want it. But he knew he was going to be a pastor, so he wanted to have some equipment to help other people who might be prayer people learn how to pray, so he was going to take my class. So we, in the class, we'd spend two weeks on a particular model of prayer. Get a little orientation and read some primary sources. Go home and pray that way. Then we come back and talk about it. Then they go, and I try to you know, get a little course correction. They go back and pray that way again. Well, I would, each year I would sort of dread the weeks that we would spend on a book called The Cloud of Unknowing, a book near and dear to my heart, 14th century English mystic text. It's, it's contemplative spirituality on steroids. For most people, I just had to brace myself, though, because it would, it would just go shoot straight over their heads. It would make no sense. It would be heretical. It wasn't biblical. It wasn't theological. It was problematic. They hated it. It was boring. They didn't know what they were doing. And no, it's just bad. So that was the general gist, and I was preparing for myself to hear that from another round of students. In comes my evangelically rooted, uh, non-praying guy, and he sits down, and well, what was it like to, to pray with the cloud of unknowing this week? And it was kind of like, you know, scales falling from his eyes. He says, I, he had the big smile. He says, I never knew that praying could be just being with God. Lo and behold, if he'd born, been born in the 14th century, he would have been a monk, right? He's a contemplative by nature, but he'd never been in a community where that realm of prayer was introduced to him. We all need these cross-cultural, within-Christian sorts of connections so that we can know what they're doing in the church kitty corner to us that might fit our soul better than what's going on in our church. So we need a well-rounded diet. We need, we need some protein. We need some carbs. We need some veggies and fruits. We need the whole, the whole deal. Um, now, the question, as I, before I dive into this, uh, into some examples of the kinds of things uh, that come to us as, as ways of praying that provide a well-rounded diet, is the question of really, who is this for? And my argument is, this is mostly for the person whose teeth you brush. If it is not something that I would say is, 
this is something that you should take back to your congregation and implement a program so that they have a better, well-rounded life of prayer, that they make some changes. This is, this is actually food for your own journey as a disciple. So now this sort of brackets out people who brush the teeth of toddlers, but mostly if it, what I'm saying is it, this matters for you. This matters in your own personal journey of discipleship, no matter how uh, much at the beginning or how much in, the, in advance you are in the journey. This is for you, uh, because then if you come to be a person who is living the life of lifelong discipleship, growing in your own vitality, well, then you've got enough of a knowledge base and an experiential base to bear witness and bring others along. It's about um, doing, some, doing this with integrity. Now, um, one thing to do, and I don't know whether anything like this will happen in workshops, but what I would encourage you to do as you think about this material, as you read Kneeling with Giants, which I really hope you will, is to spend a little time with your journal taking stock. Ask yourself, uh, on your own, after this conference is over, sit down with your journal and take stock of your own practices of prayer. And here are the questions, you know, in the course of a given day, how do I encounter or experience prayer? Do you have, some people have a very structured form of prayer life. Some people have a very a, a scattershot experiential prayer life that happens when it happens and it doesn't when it doesn't. What for you is a daily experience of prayer? And then in the cycle of a week, what's, what's prayer like in a typical week for you? Uh, what sparks you to pray? How do you pray? And then more particularly, what you need to get to as you take stock is, when I pray, what do I actually do? Now, I, I tell you, doing this with a group of people in a class or with a church, uh, where it's more of a workshop setting than, than, than a keynote setting, is a lot of fun. Because in a group, you know, there's, you know, there's a dozen or so of us here in the room, uh, and, and I don't know how many people are in your room out in TV land uh, if you're watching on your own computer or if there's a group of you watching. But in any group of people of a dozen or more, when you start listing all the things that those people do in their own personal prayer life, you get this amazing diversity. Some people connect with God by asking for things. Some people connect with God by going for a quiet walk in the woods. Some people connect with God by singing a song. Some people connect with God by writing a song. Some people connect with God by reading a book. Some people connect with God by writing a book. You know, there are, all, there are so many things. There are, so, there are physical manifestations of prayer where people kneel, where people stand, where people walk, where people jump and shout. All kinds of things, and you'd be surprised who's doing what to try to connect with God. And there's a rich diversity, and a group that works through this material can really learn a lot from one another by seeing the diversity in ways that we connect with God. But the whole helpful thing is to say, here's what I do. So that you can then sort of take up the question of, as, I, as you encounter different ways of praying, to say, which ones really match what I do and might enhance it to go one step further? And which ones really express a void in my life? Um, now, I would say that the rich diet of prayer that we really need to be nur nurturing in our lives needs to have three things. You know, I've got ten different ways of praying in my book, and if you read it and if you give them a try, you'll experience a wide variety. But what you really need is prayer, ways of prayer from all the cornucopia of possibilities in my book and elsewhere in the world that do three things. You need, a way, you need some kind of way of prayer that's going to help you speak to God, put your thoughts and hearts and feelings into words to tell them to God. You're going to need a, some kind of ways of praying that are going to help you listen to God because prayer that's just you speaking is a monologue, not a conversation. You need to find ways to listen. And you need to find some kind of way some cutting edge of prayer that takes you beyond your words that you speak and any words that God might speak to allow you to simply be. Things that go into the realm of, of the contemplative, really. You need to speak, and you need to listen, and you need to be. Now, in the book, this, that's not how my book is organized. That's just a way that to organize prayer thinking in your own experience and practice. And, you know, honestly, some of the ways of praying in the book can do you know, two or even all three of those at once. Some of them focus more on one than another. Um, but I want to mention to you in, in, a, in just a brief th few minutes, not enough to, to practice it together, because that's not really what we're about this morning, but just to give you a sense that there are distinct ways that Christians approach these tasks of prayer that do lead, the, lead you into the realm of speaking, into the realm of listening, and into the realm of being. So first is speaking. And I think that is the natural place to start. You know, we are 
we, if we're aware of ourselves as we come to an adult conversion, or as we come to just trying to plod on in the journey of discipleship having, have, after having lived an adult life, it can be kind of awe-inspiring to the point of stupefying to think, who am I to speak to the holy God of the universe when I have lived the life that I have lived? When I have sinned the sins that I have sinned, yeah, sure, God forgives me, but who am I to talk to this God? Or who am I as a low, lowly created being to talk to the creator of all? Or just philosophically, how impossible is this? I'm a material person with senses. Everything I do in the world is about my sensory engagement with the world. How am I going to draw close and commune with a God who's not physical, right? A God who is invisible, not subject to my senses at all. How am I going to do it? It can seem impossible. We need ways. Well, Martin Luther is your guy for this. Martin Luther... Um, the great Reformation theologian, um, throughout his life, wrote a lot about prayer. And in fact, he almost always wrote about it in the same way. He stuck on something before the Reformation when he was still a monk uh, that he really stuck to as a great way to pray. Um, and, it, and it came from his work as a biblical scholar because Luther went to Wittenberg to study Bible and to become a teacher of Bible. And lo and behold, when he read his Bible, he found a passage in Luke where Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Now, Luther said, therefore, whatever follows must be the best prayer, right? Because if Jesus had known a better one, he would have given us that one. This way of praying uh, was, was the Lord's Prayer, right? You find it in Luke, and you find it in Matthew, and you find it in your worship service on Sunday morning as something that you repeat. Luther knew that it was being repeated in the Catholic Mass and in the early Lutheran worship services. That was appropriate, but what he wanted to do was to give it to you as a disciple, as a conversation starter, for you as humble uh, and ashamed person who needs to talk to the holy, exalted ruler of the universe. Here, thinks Luther, is Jesus' set of topics which, God, which you know in advance God wants to hear from you from. God wants to talk to you about daily bread. God wants to talk to you about the kingdom. God wants to talk to you about forgiveness of sins. God invites you into the conversation. If you feel afraid to speak and don't know what to talk about, here's the list. Talk about these things. So it becomes an outline for meditation and adoration and intercession because Luther wants you to take the topics in the clauses of the Lord's Prayer and use it as an outline to let it lead you sometimes into prayer, praise, sometimes into confession, sometimes into thanksgiving, sometimes into intercession. So you know how it goes, right? We hear it, you've prayed it a couple thousand million times in the course of your life, so you know it. Um, you know, it starts with this form of address where it's our Father. God adopts us as beloved children. Jesus Christ says, I'm the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. You are going to be children of God in my family. We have the same Father, and you're in that relationship by adoption. So you have this intimate image, but it's the Father who's in heaven. God is outside your senses. God's outside your reach. You can't reach up and pull God down. Uh, you can't understand God. You can't claim to have a complete grasp on God. God is in heaven, far away. Close up our Father intimate. In heaven, far away, hard to reach, out of control. So you start with praise of this God who has adopted us and remains transcendent. Um, and we pray that God's name may be, may be made holy. Maybe that's confessing sins of ways that we have not reflected the honor of God's name that befits us as Christian people. Maybe it's praying that other people that are in our family would come to honor God's name. Maybe it's, maybe it's about the world and the way that we mistreat the name of God. There's a lot of confession that needs to happen about the way that the name, is, the name of Christ is claimed in our culture for things that are uh, so ungodly, Christ would simply vomit if he... It was down here, as it says in one of Woody Allen's movies. Um, and then we pray that God's kingdom would come. Well, there's a many-faceted biblical image. We pray that, the, the, that God would reign, that where the kingdom is where God is reigning, right? In us. It's about bringing our lives to God. We pray that God would reign in our families, that God's peace and justice and love would reign within our families. We pray that God would reign in our church, that we'd be unified and we'd be able to step forth in the value, living into mission in the values of God's kingdom. We pray for God's kingdom to come in evangelism, that more and more people all around the world would come to find life in Christ, to know this Christ who has come in person to draw them home. And we pray eschatologically, because the kingdom will be fulfilled at the end of the age. And, we, and then, as it says at the end of Revelation, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, we pray that it will be so. We pray that God's kingdom will come, and we pray that God's will will be done. Now, Luther's pretty funny about this. He says, oh God, don't let my will be done. 
do your will instead, because Luther knew he would mess it up. He's a broken man with a big ego, and he knew that he would mess it up. So God, please just do your will instead. Now, I think it's actually a great fodder for intercession. Because I can be awash with, mis with not knowing what to pray for for people, but I can look at the life of Jesus and I can say, Jesus was really concerned with bringing food to the hungry, 5,000 at a pitch. And I pray, God, that you would feed the hungry because right now we've got a global food crisis and I, need, I want your help as we get grain uh, that's being you know, held hostage in Ukrainian ships. We need to get it out to the world because people are hungry all over the world in Asia and Africa that need that that grain. You, let your will be done. You've shown me that you care for food for the hungry. Take action, God. So, all kinds of intercession. Those three are actually fundamentally about God. It's God's name, God's kingdom, and God's will. But then we turn to the second half of the prayer, and it's us. Our bread, our sins, and us being saved from trial and temptation. Uh, we pray for daily bread. Luther, when he was a monk, thought this was about the Eucharist, and he's right. May Christ, who is the bread of life, come to us. May we have that daily. When Luther was an older person who had become a Protestant and uh, became married and had children and had a big household to feed, he realized it's actually about praying for bread. You should really ask for God to give you bread because the people in your house are hungry. So give us today our daily bread. It's corporate, us. Forgive us our sins because we have to acknowledge that we human beings have done things that are unimaginably evil. We have done things that are truly awful to other people. Forgive us our sins. And, strangely, Jesus in his Lord's Prayer has us set ourselves up as an, the role model example to God. Only forgive me as I have forgiven others, right? To the degree that I have forgiven the sins that have come against me, to that degree, forgive me my sins. So it's a call to confession. It's a call to doing the work of forgiveness, even in your time of prayer, because if you want your sins to be forgiven, you need to forgive those other people's sins. And we pray, save us from the time of trial. Save us from temptation, you know. And Jesus knows. I mean, Jesus, God in the flesh, was led into temptation in, this, in, the, in the wilderness by God the Holy Spirit, right back at the beginning of his ministry. He knew that God could lead people into temptation, regardless of what the apostle says about God doing a temptation directly. God knew, Jesus knew that God could lead people into temptation. So you pray to not be led into temptation because the thing about temptation is it's just so tempting. You really want to do that bad thing. So you want to be led out of it and spared the time of trial because trials come and they're awful. So, and then there's the part that Luther doesn't talk about because it wasn't in his Bible. He used the Vulgate early on. Uh, that we say that the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. That's a good for thing. Even if Luther didn't talk about it, that's good for us. We give ourselves over to realizing that, the, that we want our prayers to be answered because in a way that honors God and builds God's kingdom and redounds to God's glory. We put it all back in God's hands. The thing Luther did talk about is he said should, you should say the amen loudly. Amen. It's like if you're a Star Trek fan, this is Jean-Luc Picard on the deck of the Enterprise. Make it so. Uh, I don't know if you are a Star Trek fan, but... Those, a couple of people are laughing, maybe they're laughing at me, maybe they watch Star Trek, I don't know. Okay, but that's a way of praying that is about learning to speak, about giving us language, helping us form language that is good stuff to pray about, that we're invited to pray about, that we're in fact commanded to pray about. Luther's about giving us language to pray. We also need ways of praying that are about listening. Now, a lot of Christians are about listening to God. It's become, a, in, the, in the hundred century wake of the Pentecostal movement and the charismatic movement, we have come to fool ourselves to think that listening to God is easy. You know, that we just sort of put up our antenna and the Holy Spirit speaks in a still small voice and then we know what God is saying and we go do that. Now the thing is, I don't know if you've noticed this, but sometimes the still small voices inside your head are not good voices. It's not always the voice of God. Um, in fact, if you talk to people who are committed to the institution, <laughs> Sometimes they're there because they have voices, still small voices in their heads. that are telling them to do stuff. Not every voice in your head is good. How do you discern between the voice that is your own optimism and hopefulness telling you that that's God and the other voice that's your depressiveness and hopelessness? Uh, which voice is God? We need ways that will help us to discern. Now, the genius for this was St. Ignatius of Loyola, 16th century in the Catholic Reformation, founder of the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus. Now, um, uh, I'm running too short on time to tell you the whole story, because but it's a great, it's always fun to talk about Ignatius. But Ignatius had a practice for his uh, people in the Jesuit order. Um, 
that is called the examination of conscience. We tend to call it the examine because we don't like to examine our conscience because that might intent, impl imply that we do bad things and we feel bad about ourselves. Ignatius thought we should examine our conscience. We tend to call it the examine because it sounds smarter in Latin and because it doesn't imply our conscience. Um, but Ig Ignatius would say that, well, you really just should spend some time. Every so often, you should do a really thorough general examination of your conscience. You should sit with your journal and prayerfully go through all 10 commandments and evaluate your life. Where are you making progress? Where are you falling short? And go through all the seven deadly sins and the seven corresponding virtues. Look at your life. Listen to God. The point is to listen to your life so that you know what to talk about and what, uh, what, what issues are coming up in the conversation. He also has um, the, what, uh, the, a daily process. He actually calls it the discernment of spirits, uh, where we look at the end of the day and listen for what, what things, he would call them consolations, our, the things that build up our faith, our hope, our love. Not just things that made us happy, but things that help us to love God better. Those are the consolations. And then at the end of the day, we also look for our desolations. What has happened today in my life? And I write a few things in my journal to say, these are the desolations, the things that have eroded my faith, eroded my hope, eroded my love. And you do this for a period of, if you're an Ignatian, you do this for a period of days or for a period of weeks, and you end up seeing patterns that day by day, certain things are building you up in faith, hope, and love. Certain things in your life are eroding your faith, hope, and love. And that leads you to have something to talk to God about. Now, if you're really with Ignatius, you're in the middle of a month-long retreat at this point, and he's going to say in week two of the retreat that day, every day you're going to start doing what he calls the prayer of the senses. He'll send you out with a Bible passage, and your imagination. First, your intellect. You study the passage, a gospel passage, a story with Jesus, usually. Um, you'll go out and study it. And then you come back to meet with Ignatius, and he says, okay, now go spend an hour meditating on it with your uh, imagination, with just your eyes, the, your, uh, your mind's eye. If you were in that story, I like to use the wedding at Cana, uh, if, you're in, if you were there, what would you see? Now, there's stuff the text mentions. There's stuff the text doesn't mention but you have to use your mind's imagination to see everything you could possibly see. And you know you're not doing acts of Jesus for preaching here, right? You're doing imagination for prayer. But you look and you see. And then you come back and you talk with Ignatius and he sends you out to use your imaginative uh, hearing. What would you hear? Well, of course you hear the dialogue, but at the wedding in Cana, maybe you hear the feet shuffling of dancing. Maybe you hear music playing. Maybe you hear the undertone of grumbling because the wine ran out. What do you hear that's not in the text as well as what is? And you come back and talk to Ignatius about it. And then he sends you back again to meditate with your sense of your mouth, your, your taste and your smell. What would you taste and smell in a first century Palestinian wedding? There might be all kinds of things. Are you, are you actually in a barnyard? Are you in an enclosed house? Are there bodily smells? Are there animal smells? Are there food smells? What do you take in? And then you talk with Ignatius and he sends you out to, to imagine it with the sense of your body. What do you feel as you're in that story? Which means you have to go in. You have to actually imagine yourself as a character, right? You have to be either an observer or a servant or uh, a bridegroom or a bride or somebody in that story. You imagine yourself fully into it using all of your senses. And then Ignatius would then say, okay, now go in and you're fully present and you have your question that you got from the, in, in, in your, your examine, now go and ask your question. So you go up to Jesus imaginatively, and you ask your question, and you listen, and maybe you have your journal, and you write down what you hear, and then you say something else, and you enter kind of an imaginative dialogue with your Lord within the text, within the place that God most reliably speaks, right? Ignatius knew, just like John Calvin did, that the place God wants to speak to us is in Scripture. Now, Ignatius would say, you don't get to decide the course of your life based on one of these little imaginative practices. It's not like you've got the word of God and you've made a decision. No, you're going to go back for the rest of the month, every day, with your question in mind to another passage and another passage and another passage. And it's not till the end of the month when you get to decide that you're going to become a member of the Jesuit order. That's probably what your question was. But it might be something different for you. But you, you, you work through it and you dwell with scripture and you use your imaginations and you use your senses so that you can hear over time, the whispers of the Jesus that you know speaking in the texts that you've been immersing yourself in, that's listening to God where God most wants to be, wants to, wants to speak. Last and very briefly, I will mention that we also need ways to pray, pray that are about simply being with God. And for this, um, I, would I would suggest to you the very ancient Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Christian practice called the Jesus Prayer. This was popularized 
in the West for the first time in the 19th century by a book called The, 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 the Way of a Pilgrim, in which a, a, a Russian peasant he overhears in church the passage of Paul that says, pray without ceasing, and he really wants to know how he can do that. So he starts traveling around. He's footloose and fancy free. Um, and so he travels around trying to find wise spiritual mentors. And he eventually finds, to ask this question, how do I pray without ceasing? He finds an old staritz, an old monk, a very advanced spiritual person, disciple, well advanced on the spiritual path. And he says, Father, can you teach me how to pray without ceasing? And he says, sure. Pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. That's the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. So he says it. Am I done? No, you're not done. Go back to your cell, and every day, say it 3,000 times. So it takes him a while, but he gets up to 3,000 times. He comes back to the monk, and he says, now am I praying without ceasing? He says, uh, no, actually. You need to go back to your cell and say it 6,000 times a day. Okay, so he goes back to the cell, and it takes him a couple weeks, but he comes to be able to say the Jesus prayer 6,000 times a day. And he says, finally, Father, am I praying without ceasing? Not quite. 12,000. So he goes back to the cell and he has to say the Jesus prayer 12,000 times a day. He has a little knotted cord, just one like this, um, to say the Jesus prayer and count it and keep track of how many he's doing. And by the end of that time, he cannot not say the Jesus prayer. He wakes up in the morning and his mouth is moving. He's already praying it before he's awake. Now, this is a prayer that's about words, right? It's about saying something, but it is for the sake of creating, of putting us into a contemplative space. The forefront of our mind gets occupied by these simple core gospel words calling out for the mercy of Jesus. And as that becomes habitual, we become able then to simply dwell before God with that call for mercy playing and we can dwell in contemplation. It's not directly contemplation, but it is the fount of contemplation in the Orthodox Christian tradition. And I have found many Protestants who come to enjoy using it say, as a beginning activity of a prayer time because it helps them center themselves in the presence of God in a position of asking for mercy so that they can pray. Um, so those are just three, you know, there are three, there, one of those is each, each, th each of those is a chapter in the book. There are seven others in the book to explore. But if you go into the process of uh, kind of exploring them, lather, rin lather, rinse, repeat, like with the old shampoo bottle, try it on for a while, see what it's like, try it on for a while more, and then try another one. Uh, work your way through the book. Some people like to work their way th through the book individually. I've had interactions with people who have like spent uh, 10 months on it, kind of doing one spiritual practice for a month to be a guide for most of a year. Um, sometimes do people do it in churches, and if you, if, you know, if you want to do that, I have a free small group leader's guide available on my, on my website um, that you're welcome to use, uh, and I'd love to hear how it goes. But that is the journey. Becoming the kind of disciple who embraces the whole of the onion starts with the piece that we can manage that really nurtures our soul. Di finding ways to go further up and further in in the journey toward Christ, the journey of abiding, the journey of praying, so that uh, we can then be walking in transformation and able to do the other part of the onion, which is neighbor as self and being sent out in a way that's whole and wise and good. Now, we started a little late, and I talked a little too much, and so you can tell me whether you want to do any Q&A now or whether we should go to lunch. First of all, let's give Dr. Anthony a Thank you. And he's right, we're almost at uh, lunch time, but I do want to uh, say two things. Number one, um, we will go to lunch uh, now. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll go to lunch in a moment. Um, um, our lunch time is from, well, as soon as we get out of, get out yeah. of here until 1.30. When we return at 1.30, uh, Bruce Richow will take us into a time of some uh, question and answer as well as practical application. Um, however, uh, because some questions are certainly right burning on the tip of your tongue or right at the forefront of your mind, both for those of us who are here present in the room and for those of you all who are uh, joining us via Zoom. We wanted to give just a few minutes, maybe this first, this next 10 minutes or so, okay, sure. um, for any questions that you may have. So the floor is open for any questions you have. I do want to say I've definitely appreciated uh, this uh, uh, time to talk about how prayer is uh, not outside of doing, but 
connected to doing. So I thank you for that. Thank you. Um, questions. Um, we have questions, uh, one coming from the Zoom room. Tony. Yeah, we have uh, actually two from the Zoom room. Uh, one is just more of a comment uh, and kind of how to deal with it, I guess. Anne Marie said that she told her session, prayer and activism are important. Uh, and they then asked, how are we different than the United Way? Hmm. Um, and so going from there. Should uh, I talk about that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, there's not a lot of prayer happening at the United Way. There's just more activism, right? There, it, it, that, that's, that's lots of Christian people involved in United Way agencies who are individually doing things, but the agencies themselves tend to be more secular. Um, but I think the, the, answer, the answer is partly it's prayer and activism, as Anne-Marie said. It's these both together it, as a whole sort of Christian life. But it's also, and, and, and the fact that it's coming from prayer is going to shape the why of what you're doing. And I had another thought, but escaped me because I've been talking too long. <laughs> well, that's fine because we have another, um, okay. another question. Uh, this comes from Sharon. And there are at least three University of Dubuque grad students who are required to read your book and practice this prayerful, I can't quite read all the writing there. Back to you. Uh, Sharon just wanted to share that there are at least three okay. um, students, graduates from uh, University of Dubuque Seminary that are in the Zoom room right now Excellent. who have had, who uh, as a part of their coursework were required to read your course, your book and uh, are uh, very excited. That's we've, great news. We've well, had a lot of comments. Hello to you, whether, whether you were my students or uh, whether you're uh, in the uh, concurrent program. I know that I, I have understood that in the spiritual formation classes they still use it, which is awesome. So thanks for that and I'm glad you're here. Yeah, well, I, the, the, there's one that is my, I want my, my, when I'm with a group over a longer time that's one of the most uh, fun to deal with is, is, the, is, is prayer that comes out of the Benedictine tradition, praying the daily office. And um, I, I had partic you know, I've, I've been surprised over the years as I look at Presbyterian response, both as students and in churches and judicatories, um, that praying the daily office, it seems so non-Presbyterian, you know, to open up a prayer book and go through the church's services, whether you're using a Catholic breviary or whether you're using um, uh, the Book of Common Prayer or Celtic Daily Prayer or any of the, or an app, because there are lots of good apps out there for, for this kind of thing. Uh, praying someone's predetermined words seems so non-Presbyterian, and yet so many Presbyterians find such life in it because they spend their lives making words about stuff, and it can be just exhausting. So for a lot of Presbyterians, there's enormous help in praying the daily office in one form or another because as, as one of my students, so, uh, I remember quite fondly, said, you know, the great thing about praying the daily office alone in my living room was I was in such good company, you know, because she felt like she was surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses. There are people all over the world praying the daily office, whether they're nuns and monks or other pastors or individual uh, Christians of whatever stripe. Um, there is a sense that you're, the church is praying with you and carrying you along uh, in prayer that can be a wonderful gift from that. There are, other, there are other gifts that come from Benedictine tradition of prayer, but that's one. And at the opposite end of the spectrum, um, you know, something that's really very modern uh, is I have a chapter on Agnes Sanford, who is a, a, a child of Presbyterian missionaries in China, became the wife of an Episcopal clergyman in America, um, and, and was in early 20th century part of the charismatic movement, became a major teacher of healing prayer. Uh, and she was, when you read her stuff, I mean, she's a, she's a real live wire. She's, the people that are systematic theology oriented roll their eyes at Agnes Sanford and, because some of the connections and metaphors she uses are just awful. And she will, she will sp speak in unmeasured ways that sounds like you're manipulating God, but when she's at her best, she's saying, healing is in God's hands, but we need tools so that, because, you know, honestly, when you ask for prayer concerns in a Christian group, uh, what percentage of them are for someone who's sick? We need, we desperately need ways to pray for people who are sick that actually nurture faith and participate in God's healing action. And she has real wisdom. 
you have to sift it a bit because there's a lot of craziness too. Uh, but I really, I really needed to have in the book someone from the Pentecostal or Charismatic tradition because that's like a quarter of global Christianity now, and I, I was not gonna, you know, leave that out. So, and I love, but I've always loved Agnes Sanford despite the craziness. So that's kind of the that's that's a range from chapter one to chapter ten. From, okay. Ooh, there we go. Hello. We have another question from the Zoom audience. Um, can you speak more about intercessory prayer and, and its inclusion in the worship service? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I almost need, would need to know a bit more about where the question comes from. I, but I, I mean, I can. I certainly think intercessory prayer is important. I've seen churches handle it very differently. Um, you know, I was, I was I spent five months working in a temporary position in a large church in Pittsburgh, um, and I, it struck me as I listened to the ways that the others on staff uh, prayed uh, in the pastoral prayer. They so they, they took the world in and interceded for the world, but they tended not to speak about the the particular people who had particular needs right there. That's one way to respond to it is to not talk about it too much. Um, other, but then you know that I've been in lots of little churches, little country churches, where it's really all about specifically naming every need. I think what you need to be is wise and teach wisdom uh, along the way. That when you, the, the, the great thing is that prayer is a real conversation and God remains genuinely free. Sometimes Christians get their knickers in a knot about, you know, if I pray for this and God doesn't do it, does that mean that God is not capable or God is unwilling? Well, well no, it means that God is free. Um, and you are, God invites you fully into the con conversation. You know, I've got a kid who's 12 and a kid who's 14, and I love it when they will talk to me. They're 12 and 14, they won't always talk to me. Uh, but I love it when they will, and, they can, and I, I want to hear about them. And they can ask me for stuff that I'm not going to give them. You know, sometimes they want things that I'm not going to give them. Uh, but I want them to ask, right? I want them to bring their real selves. And I think God is like that in a much, much bigger way, I think God welcomes us to intercede, but God is really not going to be subject to our manipulation. You know, you, you, God is not obligated to do exactly what you did in the exact way you asked it, but you're invited to full participation. Um, I'm, thank you. I, I'm really grateful for this and looking forward to my swag bag when I get it. <laughs> um, I, Deborah Avery, I'm from Peoria, Illinois. Um, I am interested in this in the language that you're using, this call to contemplation and activism, I think of myself as an activist, but I know that when I use that word in my congregation, it's like, you know, people's hair gets on fire because they're concerned that we're going to be marching with signs or we're going to be... Which might be called for. Which might be called for, and I do it, but I mean, like, the, you know, yeah. Like, I, I, I'm interested in having you unpack act, the word activism a little bit more so that I have, so I can copy some language down to take to my people. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Is it Deborah? Is that what you said? Yeah. Thanks, Deborah. Um, yeah, I, I use it as a, I, it's a loaded word. Yeah, so, and maybe a regrettable word, but I needed one word. Um, and uh, I think that the thing I'm trying to capture is we want, to do stuff. We want to do the work of God out in the world, right? Jesus, if we look at who Jesus is and what his agenda was on the pages of the gospel, he was really active. He worked long, long days on multiple issues and he was teaching and he was healing and he was calling and he was welcoming and all these things were active and he was calling the, calling the the problems of the society by name, you know, or at least alluding to them in very judgmental ways in his stories, he was calling for change in society. That's active. He's trying to be active and do active change. But yeah, I would not. I would say this doesn't mean you have to get a job as a community organizer or be a social activist. It's just that I guess I'm looking for. A, I was looking for a word that embodies the fact that we tend in our world in our Presbyterian church these days, not everywhere, but lots. To, to think th we, what we really need to, need to be about is doing. And I sometimes that can be to the neglect of being. And Jesus called them to be with him and be sent out, right? It's a, it's a both and. Yeah. Uh, just to add to that, and then, then we'll go get prayer for lunch. Uh, Peter Steinke tells a great story in his book. I believe it's um, a door set open about a church. And I get these figures wrong. Um, they put signs throughout the community that said, come make a difference. And 
their church grew exponentially, like 40% over six months. Um, but then over the next year, they lost about 60% of the members because they didn't do anything. <laughs> they didn't actually make a difference. It was just a slogan, come make a difference. And because they didn't put it into action, it was, okay, so why, why are we here? Um, so it's part of that doing and part of that embodying the, the Christ in the world. Yeah. Um, okay, and I know we have a lot more questions um, and probably some on Zoom, but we'll get back to Dr. Hansen and uh, Bruce will, Bruce Ray's father.